Okay, joining us now is Dr. Ngozi Konyo Iwela, who is the chair of Gavi, Gail Smith, the president and CEO of the One Campaign, and Andrew Whitty, who's a special envoy for the World Health Organization. Dr. Ngozi, let me start with you. Uh, $8.8 .8 billion uh, that you've raised. Tell me more. Well, thank you. This is a fantastic success of the Gavi replenishment, which took place on June 4th. We were seeking $7.4 billion, and uh, we were uh, very, very grateful to get 8.8. .8. These resources are going to go for two sets of things. One is to take care of our regular immunization programs in the over 70 countries that we work in. And in the next strategic period we're entering is to immunize 300 million more children and to save 8 million more lives. And, and that would take up the bulk of these resources. We also now have resources to work on the COVID-19 vaccine. And we're hoping to use that to launch a series of investments using an instrument we call the Advanced Market Commitment to incentivize manufacturers to make enough doses for low and middle income countries that we work in. Andrew, you spent your career working in the pharmaceutical industry. And we have seen some extraordinary things in the past months in response to uh, the coronavirus. Describe the kind of, I guess, things that you never thought you'd see in terms of cooperation and working towards solutions. Listen, thanks very much for the opportunity. And I, we have seen unprecedented cooperation between industrial partners, biotech companies, government, universities, all with the goal of trying to advance both treatments as well as vaccines as rapidly as possible. Typically, you'd expect a vaccine development against a new virus to take 10 or 15 years uh, with many failures on the way. Clearly, what the world is hoping for is that that can be achieved in a tenth of the normal time or even quicker than that. That's going to require an enormous amount of good luck and it's going to require an enormous application of scientific skills. And I think companies and universities all recognize that no single organization hosts all of that capability to do this kind of thing so quickly. So you really have to bring together different teams of people. You have to quickly figure out ways in which they can work together and really drive toward the mission. Now, the organization or the effort that Ngozi uh, just referred to in terms of a global coalition is trying to bring government, other philanthropic organizations together to raise uh, significant funding to help turbocharge all of those scientists to be able to do their work in just a fraction of the normal time. It's important to realize there's no guarantees in this mission though. This is a really, really difficult thing to try and achieve. We're all giving it our absolute best shot, uh, but there are no guarantees. Gail, you uh, worked on the US response to the Ebola crisis back in 2014. Ha have we learned lessons, do you think? I, I think we've learned some. I'm not sure we've learned enough. Um, one of the lessons, and I think this gets to Andrew's point, is that scientists around the world, across organizations, businesses, governments, tend to collaborate in these crises regardless of what else may be going on. I think the other thing we did learn is something about vaccines. In that case, there was a push to quickly develop a vaccine for Ebola, and we've seen outbreaks since in the Democratic Republic of the Congo where that's proven to be a very important thing. I think the big takeaway here is on this issue of global vaccine equity. And the beauty of this moment, as difficult as it may be, is that science and fairness are coalescing. We need to make sure vaccines available to everyone, but it's also really good science to do that because that's the only way to end the epidemic. We can't end it somewhere if we don't end it everywhere. Uh, Dr. Ngozi, I'm going to ask you the kind of question, that, the kind of impossible question that people like me uh, mm -hmm. often ask. This, I guess, in a way, is a race between the virus and the science. Which side is winning right now? That's a really, really tough question. I want to, to say that I've, I'm seeing incredible progress on the science that we've never seen. You know, so whilst the, the virus is ravaging in many countries and, you know, some people might say the virus is winning because of the number of cases we're seeing in some places, Latin America is doubling every, every couple of weeks, in Africa the same, but the science is racing. 
and we've never seen it move so fast. So um, I'd like to say, hopefully, if we take a little bit of a medium term view that the science will win. And you're pushing for that. Uh, Andrew, uh, one of the crucial points with this, and, and can you speak to this, is that push to get the manufacturing in place. Uh, this risky idea that you start the manufacturing before knowing for certain that you're producing the right thing. Well, so a large extent, that's a financial decision. You know, that, that is a financial risk you can take. And obviously you can make a mis you, you can get that wrong. I, I think we, we don't have to do that in all cases. I, I think the key is to make sure we have a highly responsive, very elastic manufacturing capability ready to go. I also hope that we'll end up with more than one vaccine. I think we'll have a number of different vaccines from a number of different platforms if, if we have success. So being able to really expand at rapid pace uh, that capability, I think is a key to the whole global equity situation. Clearly, the more hundreds of millions or billions of doses of capacity we're able to rely on if and when we get a vaccine, the more we're going to be able to accelerate the availability of these vaccines on a worldwide basis. I also think to the question you asked earlier, it's super important to recognize that from a health welfare as well as an economic welfare, no country can be an island in this situation. It's not great to be you know, the one country who's safe if all of the people you trade with are still struggling because the trade is not going to be there. So however you look at this, whether you look at this as a humanitarian, whether you look at this as an economist, the right strategy, really the right strategy, is to invest in a portfolio of science and research vaccine opportunity, and then to invest in the vaccination of the global population together. And that's how we're going to all, we're going to see not just the economic benefit of that, but more crucially, the health benefit of that come through much more quickly. Gail, that even in our haste to get to a vaccine, to, to try and find a solution, and we all want that so much, it's really important to remember that safety is crucial too. We have to get it right. That's absolutely true. And one of the challenges in moving as quickly as we are is to make sure that a vaccine is safe and effective. And so the importance of having multiple vaccines available matters a great deal. Some are going to be easier to deploy in some settings than others. Uh, but that's why our scientists advocate that there's got to be a period as quickly as we are moving to test and check for both safety and effectiveness. And I'm confident, based on my experience working with scientists and experts who worked on the Ebola vaccine, H1N1 and others, that there's a real commitment there to making sure that vaccines aren't deployed before we've got sufficient confidence that they are safe and effective. But it's a key step. It's one we can't skip. And for you, Ngozi, and for each of you, I'm going to ask you the same question. And I guess in some ways it's not an easy question. Uh, what is your key message to governments? And if I'm sitting at home watching this and kind of trying to figure out what I can do as an ordinary citizen, uh, what can I do? How can I be supportive of, of this program? I think you could, an ordinary citizen, civil society can be supportive by urging governments to support the effort that will help to solve the problem of COVID-19 sustainably. What, what is the reason? You have to, you, you have to urge your government to be an actor because well, it, it will only cost some billions of dollars to do this now. If we don't support this program of the ACT Accelerator and, and the COVAX facility and the efforts to get a vaccine, we will have to pay trillions of dollars later in costs, which is what has happened now. Trillions in economic costs because we could not spend billions now to find the right approach to solve the COVID-19 problem. So dear citizen, dear civil society, make sure you put pressure on your government to be an actor and to invest in this. What I would say to governments, I think the key thing is that none of us are safe until all of us are safe. And I think citizens everywhere, join your local organizations, Global Citizen, the One Campaign, any of us, sign the petitions, take the actions, because the truth is, when governments start hearing from enough people, they start paying attention. And if they want to save lives, and if they want to save money, 
And if they want to send a signal now that in a fragmented world we can unite to defeat one of the greatest threats we've ever faced, then we've got to work together. We've got to join as one. We've got to make sure that everybody is safe in order that any of us be safe. So reach out, make sure they hear from you and hear from you often. That's great, guys. Thank you so much. And I, I think the worst thing that could happen would be for developed countries to think that they've managed to control the virus and then not do the work to ensure that we have a solution for everyone around the world. And I know you're all really committed to that. So thank you, all of you, for joining this conversation. Thank you. Thank you.